Blog Talk Radio. Make Me Beautiful. Isn't that sweet? What a lovely song from Nip Tuck. I loved Nip Tuck when it was on. Unfortunately, it's over, but I thought it was a very interesting show. And um, some of it was very realistic, actually, except for all the killing and the the murdering and doctors getting away with it. But besides that, anyway, uh, welcome everyone to the show. This is Mandy Goodhandy, and I have my business partner, Todd Plank, on with me. Um, um, I had a little little time off, and we're going to talk about that, actually. We're going to talk about cosmetic surgery in tonight's show, and we're also going to, hopefully, we'll have Dr. Middleton, who is someone who has done work on me in the past and present, and uh, hopefully we'll have him on the show to talk about um, cosmetic surgery to all you fun people out there, because I know there's a lot of people who are interested in that. And we're also going to have someone who's going to come on and talk about um, another show, a third show, about Botox and injectables for all those people who are interested in being educated towards such things. But anyway, before we get into more conversation regarding cosmetic surgery, we we had another topic. Sometimes we bring up little topics we've seen on the news um, as we go along. And there's some, there was a topic in particular that was close close and near to dear and something that um, affected Todd um, deeply, and he wants to do a follow-up on that. So, Todd, please go ahead. Oh, I just want to mention that today the uh, we talked about the kid who got murdered on the streetcar by a police officer a few weeks ago. Oh, now I can actually use the word murder because uh, the police officer was charged with second-degree murder today. And, um, I mean, he is still innocent until he's proven guilty, but it's a big step in the hopefulness of people that saw the video, and it's a good example of citizen journalism, because I'm sure if those YouTube videos didn't exist, um, tradition would say that the cop might have got away with it entirely unscathed. Now, he still has to go to court, and he still will be out on bail, and he still might get off, but at least it is. Uh, it was quite quick. I was talking to Mitchell about this and then, because he knows how politics work, and he just said even just how quick this is done is unheard of. So mm-hmm. usually they would drag it out for months and months and months mm-hmm. and hope, you know, try to hope everyone forgets about it. But this time I don't think they could get away with that. It's sad. One more, one more thing that's interesting that we have um, access to this technology now. Um, there's a lot of things that can't, we can't get away with anymore because people can instantly capture it. But, now they're going to come up with something, of course, the next excuse will be, well, that was doctored or that was fixed or, you know, they they put that image in there. and So it might get even more complicated, but I, I'm, I'm glad um, to hear about that, that there was, a, you know, some sort of action towards this, um, and it happened that quickly. Um, yeah. It's it not really... I, I, it's inter- segueing into cosmetic surgery from that, but um, <clears throat> I am. Todd, Todd knows this about me. But, um, there's a lot of trans women out there, and probably some trans men um, that they make it their lives work to talk about cosmetic surgery, and that's okay. It's okay. Tra- uh, transitioning, and it's all it's all up to the individual, and if they want to share things publicly, that's fine too if they're educating people or they feel it it makes them feel better to get it out of the system and any way they want to deal with it, I'm fine with that. Um, It's not something that I talk about a lot, cosmetic surgery. I mean, it's no secret. I have brought it up on occasion in passing that obviously I've had procedures done and anybody who doesn't know that is either blind or confused. But um, it's not something that I feel for me, it's something I want to, you know, really talk about publicly all the time. Uh, there's, there's a lot more to trans women and trans people in general than just their trans, their physical transition. 
<clears throat> so that's why I don't really <clears throat> get into this up much. Are you there? Do we get disconnected? Uh, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Oh, sorry. I had to mute for a second. I was, I got something caught in my throat. Okay. <clears throat> yes, it's um, not much fun getting something caught in your throat, especially when you're by yourself, which means you're not having fun while you're getting that something caught in your throat. But so anyway, cosmetic surgery uh, to me, it's it's a personal thing. Um, but I also feel as a trans woman who's someone who's experienced um, cosmetic surgery, I I I want to share it. Uh, to a certain degree with people out there that might be curious about um, going in for cosmetic surgery or considering to go in for cosmetic surgery. And it might help. Maybe I can educate somehow to a certain degree or, you know, put something out there for people that want to hear about it. Um, But my disclaimer here is I am not and I do not recommend, I'm not recommending cosmetic surgery to everyone. And I'm not saying that trans women need to have cosmetic surgery or any sort of facial and body modifications. Okay, it's up to the individual. And I think what happens is that personal relationship with you and your mirror and your doctor, I think that's an important part of it. If you're looking at yourself and you really feel that you're not at the point you want to be, then it could help your confidence. That doesn't mean it's going to, but it could. As long as you're doing it for you and how you're going to feel, not how other people are looking at you or viewing you. That's where the mental part of cosmetic surgery comes in. We have to be careful. It's not an easy fix, and it's not something that's going to make you into somebody else. Okay, it just doesn't work that way. And if you're seeing a doctor who is a good doctor, and they turn around and they agree with everything you want to have done, you may want to look into his credentials a little further. Because a doctor knows what they can handle, they'll know what you can handle, and and between the two of you, you work out a relationship. But my decision for choosing cosmetic surgery was personal, like I said. And um, choosing to talk about it is to perhaps reach out, to others um, who are struggling to make the decision. So, All right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. You don't have any put in. That's fine. Okay. Lo- I don't um, have that to say, but I'm kind of Oh, okay. Well, I want to go, Todd, as you know, uh, my, my physical transition. I want to clarify transition here, by the way. Um, I listened to a speech by a brilliant trans woman um, who was speaking. Um, She was getting an award, um, and I don't remember her name, and I apologize. I'm terrible with names. Sometimes I have some confused about my own. But um, she was getting an award. She She was a lady who was part of the team who did The Matrix. Yeah. Okay, yeah. and they were giving her an award. She, as it tra- turns out, she went through uh, a transition, and she is a trans woman, living as a trans woman now, and um, she went through this whole sex change. But one thing she said in her speech made a lot of sense when she said, I am not transitioning. She said, how can I transition when there was no transitioning going on? I was always, always felt I was a woman. And she was right. So we have to clarify so when I say transition now, I clarify and say physical transition to become more looking physically more like a female as opposed to looking like a male. But when it comes to transition, she's absolutely right. You already know that is your transition. You've already gone through your mental and emotional transition, whether you know it or not, if you are actually a trans person. You would know that. You live it every day. Yeah, I remember that speech. Her name is Lana Wachowski, director of The Matrix. If you're good with Google, you can find her speech with, like, you know, 30 seconds of clicking around. It's quite, it was quite a well-received speech, and it was worth watching. Yes, thank you, Tara. And she, she's funny and, and intelligent and um, yeah. just, lo- just lovely. 
I, I, I adored her speech. <clears throat> um, and she's one of those people that wasn't looking for it. She wasn't trying to get out there and up front. They, they came to her. They offered her this award, and she was, she graciously was accepting it, even though she said naturally, she's not the type of person naturally who likes to get in front of an audience. But she dealt with an audience extremely well, though, you know. But around 15 years ago, <clears throat> when I was looking into my physical transition. 15, well, maybe about 20, 20, 15 to 20 years ago. And Todd, you would even know this because um, there was hardly any doctors in Toronto that were cosmetic surgeons that even knew how to deal with this. Uh, to deal with, first of all, implants on someone they felt was male, um, to deal with facial surgery reconstructing facial surgery. I'm not talking about facelifts and, and eye lifts or anything like that. I'm talking about physically changing the face. They weren't doing it, and a lot of them didn't know much about it. So we've come a long way, and we're lucky, but it's still not every every doctor in Toronto knows how to deal with the trans situation. Well, um, specialized. Facial feminization surgery, they call it, right? That's yes. Some of them are looking into more and are specializing in it, yes. Um, but I, I was I was fortunate, of course, when when I um, researched a while ago and, and found Dr. Middleton, who's a doctor that I've seen here in Toronto, and has been, I've been very happy with his work. Um, <clears throat> but I was fortunate, and but in a lot of cases, as you know, it's hard. People are going down to Mexico and South America and such and getting, like, the cheaper procedures are cheaper down there. And of course they would be. Uh, the doctors down there are not paying the the overhead that they have to pay here in Canada. And they're not always bad either. Right? No, 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 they're not. Um, I, I went to Doctor Sunny, who was in, in Guadalajara. I went to him because he did the back rib operation, which is for those people out there that don't know, um, they can take the back the back of your rib cage and they push it in a bit because your ribs are actually quite pliable. And he specializes in that. He he gives you that. So you have that curved butt coming out, a very feminine look, uh, coming down the back and, and jutting out. And I have a, I'm a fan of that procedure. There's a few procedures, because my perspective is I've seen so many girls go through so many surgeries over the years in my role as working with them. And... Um, I remember it sounded very crazy to me, and there's a lot of myths. Like, people are like, oh, Pamela Anderson. A lot of people think, you know, they remove the ribs or things like that, and I'm not sure if they do do that. But I remember Dr. Middleton actually said himself, um, un unofficially, I'm not speaking for him, but he said it's not that unsafe of a procedure. He said it's quite pliable. It's not something he does. Um, mm. But uh, the results from that are incredible. I've seen a lot of girls with it. It just changes their whole look of their ass and the lower back and it just moves. Yeah, so anyway that was one of the reasons I went down to Mexico originally the first time was because this doctor in particular they dealt with that and um, <clears throat> and when I did meet him, I, 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 he was a very nice man and he and he certainly did a, did a good job and he deals with a lot of the ladies and um, so when I went back down again it was for facial um, the second time when I went back and it was a thousand dollars per procedure that he charges, and um, it's it's very uncomfortable down there. And I'm warning people if they're going to go down to Mexico, I'm not warning you because it's Mexico. I'm warning you because you're going to a country that you're not a citizen, and you have to be so careful. Make sure that you check yourself into a hotel that is American based and um, secure. And then go back and forth to the clinic and go nowhere else. And that would be my only suggestion, if any. Uh, the doctor doesn't doesn't speak a lot of English, so you might want to hire a translator while you're down there, or know somebody who can speak Spanish. But anyway, that was part of my problem was the communication part. But I went down there the second time. It was for brow brow shaving, um, because he does that kind of procedure and. Um, it was pretty. It was good, but I was a little freaked out because I woke up the next morning. I had a team of four people standing over me, 
looking at me, and and after the surgery was over, and I was freaked out. I didn't know what was going on. I thought I was dying, and I didn't know, and, and they couldn't communicate with me because they could only speak Spanish, and then all of a sudden they just all kind of looked at me. It was as if to say, oh, she's awake, okay, fine, and they all laughed. And I thought, what the hell was that about? I mean, it's pretty traumatizing. You know, you're in you're in a foreign country. You know, you have a doctor who doesn't speak English, and then you've got a team of medical people standing over you. I mean, you're going to get a little worried. But so that kind of woke me up, and I went, you know, I I don't mind Doctor Sunny. I I think he's he's a nice doctor. He's a good doctor. He's done a lot of really good work for ladies. But it wasn't. I'm uncomfortable going back there again unless it's something to do with body work, if I decide to get more body work done, because he is good with that. But anyway, I thought I would say that. Other than that, Dr. Middleton, I went into, um, I'm healing now, because I went in on Monday, and I had what I call a refreshener. And I've spoken to Todd about this. Uh, Refresheners are just small procedures that I decide to have for cosmetic purposes and, and to make me feel a little more confident and and youthful. Um, when it comes to actual physically changing your face, those those I don't mind talking about, only for educational purposes. The other things are nobody's fucking business except my own, so I'm not going to go on about that. Um, all people need to know is, yeah, 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 I got something done, and then the next time you see me, I'll just look a little more refreshed. But anyway, so I come... Yeah. Like I mentioned, I've had my brow shaved. Okay, that's for those people that don't know. They 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 um they they shave across the brow, so that it gives you a more feminine forehead. When you say shave, you're talking about the, the bone. bone. They shave the bone. Okay. Pardon? Yeah, I'm just gonna okay. ask clarification questions. Yes, and then I had a while ago. I had a shave. It was a doctor in Toronto. It wasn't Doctor Middleton. It was a doctor before Doctor Middleton who shaved my chin line. Um. They actually shaved down the bone. They, they they contoured your face a little more feminine along the chin. So I had that done, and then if most of the, and I had cheek implants put in. So because that has definitely has something to do with our physical transition. So uh, the cheek, you know why the cheeks was one of the easiest things. Uh, the bone shaving, the one on the forehead, nothing. It was just something. That's, you're, you're, you're swollen, it just kind of, you know, it was fine. Um, after a couple of weeks, everything was fine. The chin was a little uncomfortable. Um, it, it hurt a bit, you know, for a while, uh, touching it and everything else, because I don't know why, but uh, it was just more uncomfortable than the brow. Um, the cheek implants was nothing. It was like it was like I didn't have anything done. Uh, um the feeling and the healing of it. it. It healed extremely quickly, and the results were, were great as far as I was concerned from, from, from me. And then other than that, it's been injectables, you know, having things injected in the cheeks to make them a little bigger, and um, the lips, of course, uh, injectables in the lips. And I've had my lip lifted twice. Uh, the, the the reason for the lip lift, in my opinion, is the smaller the distance between the top part of your lip and your nose, the more feminine your face can look. And I don't know if people would notice that. If you have a chance when you're looking at photos, um, <clears throat> t- take a look at that. Between the distance between a man's upper lip and nose, the distance between the woman's. And usually the woman's is a smaller area. And it's just more feminine. Is and so, this commonly done? Is this a common sort of procedure for trans women? It is very common now, yes. I don't know if a lot of trans women do it. I can't speak for other trans women. I, d- I don't know a lot of what they've had done, but I know it's something that, that ladies have mentioned to me that they've had done. Uh, they can do that two different ways. They can cut under the, where the nostrils are and lift up that way. Or they can cut right along the lip line from the top and lift it up that way and re-sew it. But it's one of the things I believe in, is the lip. So that's something I don't mind talking about. There's things I had done, and it was all about trying to feminize the face more. Um, So there, I've shared secrets. I remember something interesting you told me. uh, What about breasts? 
Are, are you allowed okay. to talk about that? Oh, yeah, of course, because if anybody thinks that I was born with it, you used to have another thing coming. But right. um, the, the breast implants, it's all an individual thing, and it, it's very important that the ladies out there, I mean, people will ask me, they go, where did you get your breast done? And, you know, some people will look at my breasts and they say nothing. Others will, I'm talking about trans women amongst themselves, trans women will look at them and go, wow, I want those. I want mine to be like that or I want mine to be. It's all up to the individual. I've never really looked at any other girl's breasts and went, I want those because we're all built differently. And it's like, again, it's between you and the mirror, whatever you feel. Um, unfortunately, a lot of the girls think that breasts should be close together. And sometimes they go in and they have that done and it becomes one breast. It's just so ridiculous. It's like, no, I, I, honey, let me just tell you all my darlings out there, women's breasts are not stuck together, okay? Maybe when they're wearing a push-up bra, okay, perhaps. But your breasts have to look natural without a bra on, and then you know you've got good implants. Because you can do anything with the bra. You can adjust them to anywhere you want them to be. But they shouldn't look like they're always in a bra when they're not. That sort of must be very complicated to do. Um, because I've seen, I've seen, I don't know, I could say I could probably see like 40 or 50 pairs of trans women breasts and bare, like right dancing on stage over mm-hmm. the years. And they, they vary so much. And I know so many girls who have had to go and get it done second time or third mm-hmm. time where they have to get it adjusted. And maybe this is part of where you're talking about obsession, too, where they, they go, maybe they're too obsessed sometimes with it. But I just noticed there's such varying degrees of success and, and very a lot of self-criticism and other people criticizing the breasts. You yeah, know, it's... The, um. It's hard It's hard to say because, like I said, it's up to the individual. Um, with me, I was happy with my first, um, which is what I have. I've I had them done once. I, I like them. Um, and I'm comfortable with them. And they're, But they're silicone. And I was, I was fortunate because in sil- silicone was not legal. Silicone formed, um, formed breasts were not legal here in, in Canada. Uh, Dr. Middleton was the, one of the first doctors that got the silicone breast when they became legal. And uh, they're the most natural ones you can get. The saline, I wouldn't even go there with the saline. And that's like the the salt water type. And they break easily, and you have to keep getting them replaced sometimes. And there's a lot of problems with them. But I was fortunate, like I said, but of course it cost a lot of money when they first came along because it was rare. But I was happy I got them because they're softer. They ended up sitting more natural because they're kind of heavier. So once they're... See, what happens with some of the girls is they get their implants and they're high up and they just sit very high. They don't seem to understand that eventually they sink into place. And you shouldn't panic. And sometimes... They end up going, well, I want to get new ones because I don't like that they're too, too high, and I'm trying to explain to them. No, they, they will fall. You have to be patient, you know, and they do end up just falling into place. But but it is difficult for a doctor because in a lot of cases, the doctor is putting a, a set of breasts into a chest that's shaped male. Okay. So it's hard, and it is helpful. There's one suggestion I will say for sure when you're getting breast implants Go on hormones first if you can, because the doctor has something to work with when he sees where the natural breast will go on your body. And that's what I was, I was fortunate because I was on the hormones first. And so Dr. Middleton had something to work with. And it was like, well, naturally, this is where her breasts would grow. If she was growing natural breasts, this is where they would sit. And also maintenance. I have, I don't know how I have I've accumulated this knowledge, but you know sometimes we deal with a lot of wild girls and party girls, and I've I've known from you and other girls that the doctors are adamant that you must massage your breast in a very mm-hmm. particular way, and you must do it how many times a day for how many weeks. But they tell you, and then some girls are just lazy and they just come out and they want to start running around and partying, yeah. and it forms uh, scar tissue, yeah, and then. Yeah. 
and then the breasts are hard, it's all because they didn't just take the fucking time to put the work into it mm-hmm. and then keep keep take it easy. So that that's advice. It really it makes a difference. Oh, it does, Todd. And you know, uh, the, the healing procedure is almost more important than the procedure itself. Uh, you have to take that time out to heal. And I have seen the same thing, Todd. I've seen girls that get the, the next day or a week later with a nose job and they run out to the bar to have a drink or they just got their breath done and they're wearing a push-up bra and it's like, oh, my God. It's like you need to take care of yourself, you know. And part of that taking care of yourself is getting used to the procedure you had done. And the healing time is perfect for that because then it becomes you become comfortable with with a procedure. And massaging your breath is extremely important. You have to break down the scar tissue so you don't they don't harden over. You know, because that you're screwed once that gets done. You're gonna have to get another set done. Or the doctor's gonna have to put you through other procedures. But you know, and it's traumatic enough. You know, um the implants when I got the implants done, uh the healing wasn't, it didn't take too long, but of course I always look after myself because you know I have, I have my regimes that I, whatever the doctor tells me I have to do, I do it. And I take my time because you're spending all that money, you know, on it and you want to make sure it works out well. But the only problem I had was getting up. It was um, for the first couple of days, it's very, because you're not used to the weight and you're not used to having something on your chest like that. And so it takes a little while to get used to, at least a couple of days to get used to that heaviness. And so when you're lying down and you had to get up for something, it was like it was just a little, you know, it was a little bit of a strain. But other than that, it's not. And I, to clarify about, I want to mention this about cosmetic surgery, everybody out there. People go on about how, is it painful? Is it pain? That's the first thing people always ask. I'm going to tell you. Cosmetic surgery is not painful. If it's painful, then something went wrong. So if you're having pain within the first, you know, two after the first couple of days of cosmetic surgery, you should go call your doctor because it should not be painful. It's uncomfortable. Uh, is there a mild pain? Yes. Throbbing? Yes. Is it an unusual feeling? Yes. And they give you painkillers for that. But as someone who is not into medications, and I've already been always been clear about this. I don't do painkillers and things like that. The first day I'm on painkillers, after that I get off of them immediately. So believe me, I've experienced exactly what a procedure would feel like afterwards without painkillers. So I would know for sure if it was painful or not, and it's not. It's just uncomfortable. And it looks scary. Whatever you hand done, it does. You're just you scare yourself because you look in the mirror and it's like, Oh my god and it's a traffic accident. Well, exactly. And it looks like you were hit by a car. It's and even the slightest thing you have done on your face is gonna be bruising and swelling. It's that simple. And you better be prepared for it mentally because I wasn't. When I had my first procedures done, oh my god, I looked in the mirror and it's like and I thought, Oh, I'm gonna look lovely and I looked at and it's like my face was so blown out like a blowfish on acid. It was horrible. It was like my face was just blown right out, and I thought, oh, my God, what happens if it stays like this? But it's it's very traumatizing, that part of it. So try not to look in the mirror too much after you, you have your cosmetic surgery. You know, don't live in the mirror because you're going to end up depressing yourself. And painkillers are very addictive, and I've observed perhaps a disproportionate number of people in the trans woman community who are into painkillers because they got into them by accident. And I know people who are not in the trans woman community who have a similar thing, like the doctor gave them some Percocets because they had a bad back, and the next mm-hmm. thing you know, they're hooked on them. And they're they're really, they're really, um, when I'm listening to what she's saying about you can get through the pain without them if you possibly can try because if you have even slightly addictive personality, they're quite easy to get hooked on. Oh, yeah, because it's delicious. 
It's yeah, absolutely it's delicious. It. it is. I mean, after you after you have your initial surgery, they've already got you like pumped up on on all sorts of painkillers, and you feel delightful. And you're waking up out of the surgery, and you just want to go out and party. And you love everybody around you until you see yourself. But I'm just saying, it's like, and then when you're doing the painkillers. After that, it's like you're always medicating yourself and always feeling good. You can lull yourself right into that. And so this is why I wean myself off as quickly as possible because I know I could get addicted to something like that. You know, and I don't want to get addicted to it, but I'm not judging, but I'm just saying. But Todd is right. I mean, painkillers, that's that's a hard one. When people are on painkillers, Todd calls it disconnect. Oh, yeah, with this association. Yes, and it's like you just kind of, you can't even reason with people who are painkillers because they don't know what they're being like. You know, and you're trying to talk to them, and it's like, okay, you're not getting what I'm saying to you. I've seen people go in for more cosmetic surgery, and I swear their choice to go in for more is clouded by the painkillers they got hooked on in the Mm. first place. And then, you know, three or four years later, they're, they're a mess. They're looking mm-hmm. kind of like Michael Jackson, and then they go to rehab, and then they they come out of it, and then they admit, oh yeah, I really got fucked up there. They get obsessed. Yeah, that that that's sad if you if you get carried away with that. It's like anything, any addiction of any kind. Um, we all have to be careful with that, you know. It's um, especially when you're you're a trans person, you're trying to change yourself physically, and. You start nitpicking, Todd, you know, and you look at yourself. And if you look at yourself for a second in the mirror and you remember the man or the woman you used to be and you see parts of that, you can get dragged into it where you're going, no, no, I need that fixed because that reminds me of him or that reminds me of her. And what you've got to do in your head is just like any uh, the rest of your your transition and your emotional transition and your mental transition that is part of you you cannot get rid of that in fact you should welcome it and go okay yes that still looks a bit like the way I always was but that's me that's part of me and and always remember there's no such thing as to turn around and go she looks 100% woman and she doesn't. It's It doesn't work that way. A lot of women have masculine traits and a lot of men have feminine traits and it's the same physically. You can't be tough on yourself because then you're going to go over the edge. Yeah, I mean, just look at the Arthur. That would be hard to do. She passed away. Well, look at pictures. Watch Golden Girls. Okay. I didn't think she was a bad example. No, I meant she's an example of somebody who is a woman who had masculine features. Oh, okay, yeah. yeah. Sorry, I wasn't sure where you were going with that. Um, yeah, there's a lot of uh, women who you wouldn't say are pretty, you know, like they would call a handsome woman or whatever. But, I mean, but we all, we all want to, we figure if we go to a cosmetic surgeon, he's going to be the answer to everything and make us look like, you know, somebody else. And the important thing is when you go in to see one, you shouldn't be trying to look like someone else. You should be trying to make the best of who you are, you know, and it should be about you and how you, how you can feel. But no plastic surgery is going to turn you into into somebody else. It just It's impossible. You know, you've seen it, and I'm sure a lot of people have seen it, but you know what? There's one thing when you look at somebody with a lot of cosmetic surgery and they look amazing on film or amazing in pictures, that doesn't mean when you see them in broad daylight with no makeup on, that doesn't mean they're going to look the same. So don't always judge it that way. You know, we have to be careful with that. And, and I was going to, I want to talk about the trans guys out there, actually. Um, tra- trans men, I, I don't know if it's the same way, but it's a few years ago I was talking to some some of the trans guys out there, they used to come by our club a lot and, and they would be talking about their upper surgery and how much trouble they had finding doctors who were good at it and then doctors that weren't charging an arm and a leg. And I feel bad about that. 
And and I'm just wondering if there's a way that a lot of the trans guys can kind of get together or form something on Facebook or whatever, because I'm telling you, part of the relationship with your, your, with your uh, cosmetic surgeon is creating deals and a relationship with them. If you plan on doing ongoing cosmetic surgery, even if it's over a period of like decades with the same doctor, because that's the kind of relationship I have with Dr. Middleton. Dr. Middleton knows that I will send referrals. Dr. Middleton knows that I talk to people. He knows that I'm out there and people can see me. His work is being shown. And so when you do more than one procedure as well, a doctor will work with you. So don't go to a website and start looking at prices. It doesn't work that way. And don't phone up for Christ's sake. Don't phone up the office and go, how much would it be for this? Because they're just going to give you a general amount. You need to go in and talk to the doctor. Always, always, always go in and pay that extra little bit of money, okay, to have um, a consultation fee. Because if you end up having surgery with the doctor, it's deducted from your surgery, but it's important that you you go in and you talk to these doctors because you've got to. You might not be comfortable with a particular doctor, and I could be comfortable with that doctor. So it has to be somebody that you're able to work with. And and also, he will work with you for with your expectations of what you're expecting, how you feel your results are going to be. And he will tell you the truth if he's a good doctor. And he will say, yes, I can do that for you, but, you know, it could not be what you're looking for. I can give you the best that we can get you. Because you've also got to remember, ladies out there, any of the trans women listening out there, when it comes to the, 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 the filing of the bone and everything I was talking about with the shaving, you can only go so far with that. You can't make your skull into a little teeny skull because it's just not there. It'll fall apart. You know, and it's like, and I think this is what's happening with some girls out there when I'm looking at them and I'm going, oh, my God, it's like that. I could probably put my finger through your forehead, you know, and you have to be careful because you still have years ahead of you. I'm lucky I'm older, so whatever I'm playing around with, you know, that's a little different. But we're talking about young girls out here, and they're going to end up with no face left, and I'm concerned about that. You know, where they all think there should be a tiny little nose and you should have no forehead whatsoever and you should have no chin. And, you know, and it's like, no, it doesn't work that way. Oh, can I talk about noses? <laughs> oh, God. I know that's one of your, that's one of your, you know, thank God for this. I've never, I haven't had to have anything done to the build, the, the, um, the structure of my nose. So I was just lucky. Okay, we all have our thing, you know, but I was just lucky that way because when you're right, Todd, whenever you're going to talk, I know what you're going to talk about. It's like it's scary, and I'm glad I didn't have to go through that. Noses are I, – I, I've, there was a period when we had – this is a good time to talk about the Remington's period. There was a period when we were doing the strip events and the girls that were working with us were making quite a lot of money in in, in this one sort of period because there was you know maybe about 12 or 13 of them. There were no other events in the city and they were, they were making fortunes. And every week it seemed somebody was on a surgery break and they were all getting like they were all just and some of it was great and some you know they, but they kept going and going and going and then this was like this dense period of about two years where they were all doing their 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 uh, physical transition stuff. But some of them were getting obsessed with noses. And I've noticed to this day, people, that's the one thing, uh, I swear, people, I don't understand. I can't put myself in the mindset of a trans woman and understand what they do to their nose because uh, they'd come back from the first one and I'd be like, oh, wow, that looks awesome, great, you know. And then they'd go, oh, I'm going to get it done again. And then they go a second time and then they come back. And then I remember one particular person and she went, I think it was the second time or the third time, and she and I said, please, I said, it's 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 great right now. I just have this feeling. If you go one more time, you're fucked. Like, it's, it looks, it looks, you know, I mean, even in private, private mind, I probably thought it was a little bit small, but yeah. it was still structured like a nose, mm-hmm. you know, like it still looked, but she went one more time and she came back and it had caved in mm-hmm. and she had a hole in the side of her nose. And then she was really depressed. She said, she said, I can't even go to get this fixed for at least six months because the doctor said I have to let it settle. I don't know what the 
clinical reason was, but she couldn't even get it fixed. And even when she did get it fixed, it was basically just to get rid of the hole. Yeah. And her nose is now gone, really. Yeah. For the rest of her life, she can't really have a nose. It's very much like what Michael Jackson looks like. We're very familiar with that. I mean, he had way too many nose jobs. It, it becomes it becomes that obsession again, and it's the middle of the face. So a lot of people will judge the center of the face and work their way out. They, they don't seem to understand that your nose has to match your face. And I do understand that some of the ladies out there um, probably have larger noses, and that's understandable if they want to do something to change that. In, in their mind, they want to do something to change that. But remember, women, some women do have bigger noses, by the way. You know, it's not as if every woman in the world has a little teeny nose. But what happens is they, they're, then they just start looking at the nose, Todd. They forget the rest of the face, and then they're just concentrating on making that nose tiny, forgetting that the rest of the face is not. And so it ends up looking ridiculous. What is the I don't, what is the tiny obsession? Is that like I've I've seen a lot of females. They don't I mean that have very nice features. They don't. Their noses aren't the size of a little tiny check mark. No. Like, what is it with trans women and tiny noses? Is I don't know. I think they take it from the, I don't know some of the great beauty movie stars or models. I have no. You know, you're asking the wrong person. <laughs> We'd have to have somebody on who's obsessed with nose jobs because I'm certainly not one of them. And um, I think as long as, as long as your nose matches your face and as long as, you know, it's a shape that you're happy with. Um, but they want to have this little peaky thing at the end. It's like a, I don't know. Uh, it like sticks out. Pardon? I heard it was like a ski slope or okay, something. Okay, and it yeah. sticks. Yeah, it goes up and it sticks, but they want a little point at the end. I, I don't get it. I, I don't think it's even all that attractive, but that's just me personally. And 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 you're right. Sometimes I saw some of the girls you're talking about. I, I was right in there with it because I that was during the where I was getting my when I started doing my um my hip injections, my button hip injections was during that period where all the girls were getting surgery and I was right in there with them. There was a lot of us and we were just going through all these processes because we were making the money, you're right. It was like it was a lot of money coming through and um and so it was all about that and i watched exactly what you're talking about and i would never say anything because that coming from me would look like i was being tacky or jealous or whatever and so whenever they asked me and i brought this up on the show before when girls ask me how how i think they look or any particular part of them looks i don't tell them it's like if you have to ask me then there's a problem, okay? You need to be happy. What do you think? They need to be content with it. You can't ask other people. So I got to that part where I couldn't even say because they'd be coming up to me doing that. Oh, what do you think of my cheeks? Do you think I should get more done here? And you know what? They didn't care what your answer was anyway because they were gonna. They already had in their head what they were going to get done. So it was a big waste of time. And it would be like talking about the weather, you know, so you so I just didn't even bother anymore at that point. It was like, you know, what, what do you think? If you think you should have more done, then whatever. It's like, but yeah, I saw some of them falling apart because it was just too much, and some of them were beautiful to begin with. Yeah, like absolutely stunning with this, you know, like the natural, like a, a very natural beauty to them, and then they just started looking like, you know, cosmetic dolls. So are we talking about injections? Is that part of it? Uh, my injections? Well, oh, but yeah, or in, in general. But well, we're going to be bringing somebody on, like I said, that's going to actually talk about injectables. No, I'm talking about the silicone injections. Oh, um, well, the silicone injection, as you know, it's very uh, black market. So yeah. um, the person who's going to be coming on talking about injectables, by the way, everybody is actually a nurse that will be coming on who actually is located here in Toronto, who does um, Botox and injectables. It's not the silicone black market <laughs> stuff. But um, <clears throat> I know that there is, there's, there's people, I can't share a lot of information because it's, it's, it's very secretive. Yeah. And But there is someone that comes to town, and but you have to know somebody who knows somebody, and it's very, it's, uh, it's very secretive. Um, so there is silicone injections coming through. 
you have to be careful who you go to again because you um I'm not even recommending it so so please don't take this as a recommendation it's something that worked for me and I'm content with myself and and you know and what I got done and but I can't recommend foreign substances going through your bodies I just can't all I can say is I took a risk and I took the chance and that was my choice um it was silicone um, it was silicone, but it was medical-based silicone. So I do know that much, and I know there was nothing, um, there was none of that oil nonsense or anything put into my system. I do know that because I did a lot of research and everything else, and, and uh, rec- was recommended through other girls. And but be careful, you know. There was that woman that was going through Toronto. I heard about. It turned out that she was she was she was doing that. She was doing these illegal injectables and she's made a few people sick yeah it's very common so there's a lot of there's a lot more media about it recently mm-hmm. as time has gone on um but a lot of a lot more south american girls um but where they're getting they're getting injected with improper substances just yeah. by people who are taking advantage of the fact that they're just so desperate to get hit but yeah there's not a lot of options and now South America also and Mexico is starting to get into the the implant now the the, the butt implant and the hip implant but there seems to be a lot of uh there's still a lot of problems with them because you're putting I don't know I can't even imagine because the breast implant is one thing but when you get your butt implants done you you probably have to lie on your stomach for like you know quite a while um it could be uncomfortable and painful, but then who am I to say? I don't know. I've never had implants done down there. But like I said, I got the injectables, but I've taken my time getting them. I would get something, some done, and then I would wait six months to a year, get more done, and then just build on that. Because if you think you're going to get silicone injections and it's only going to cost like $1,000, for example, that ain't happening. Your first time when you get the silicone injections, it's like you had nothing done. And what what you're doing is you're building a base. And I must have, I, I think at this point, I've, I must be up to at least $15,000. Yeah, at least. With the number of visits that I've had. But again, that's not something I'm recommending. That's just something that was my choice. And, and uh, was it painful? Is it... Is somebody putting a needle in you painful? If it's painful for you to have a needle put in you, then yeah. yeah. You feel a bit of a pain when the needle goes in, and then you feel pressure as they're pushing the needle in. Because what they're doing is they're pumping up the muscle with silicone. So you have to imagine how that would feel. With me, I have a very high tolerance for pain. You know, I can put up with a lot of pain. I did um, electrolysis or something else I want to bring up with people out there, too. Um, electrolysis, I did it the old-fashioned way. <laughs> you know, each individual hair on my face was zapped, okay, over and over and over again. And I was I had electrolysis for about six years, six to eight years, almost every single week having it done. Uh, it cost a fortune over over the, the the length of time I had it done, but well worth it for me. It was just no hair problems on the face, and I know when it comes to the lasering, they've come a long way with lasering. That is true, but uh, for facial hair removal, it's still not a hundred percent. Um, if you have gone through your laser hair removal and you've been doing it for a few years now and you just have that last struggle, I would suggest going for regular uh, electrolysis just to get rid of the the last part of it. But even then, that doesn't guarantee that your hair is not going to grow back later because, again, Todd, we're talking age here. We're talking, you know, um, people who were young men, 15, 16, who never really started even growing facial hair yet, who went on hormones. But when you get older, the hair grows in more. And I don't think people realize this or they don't want to. And it doesn't matter, you know, how many blockers you're taking. You're still going to get facial hair at some point. Women do, for Christ's sake, when they go through menopause. So 
the the thing is, and it's a known fact that, that with males, the, the the root of the hair is stronger. It's just a natural thing. So that's obviously because it's just testosterone, and, and but probably to a certain degree, you are blocking um, that. But anyway, it's 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 a tough one for the younger people out there, you know. But uh, like I said, like uh, regular electrolysis works for me, and I was quite quite pleased with it. I don't go to electrolysis anymore. I could go every now and then if I want, because you do get the occasional hair, obviously that will grow. And um, but I haven't gone in a long time, so that was well worth it for me. But again, it was painful as hell. Each individual needle, you got you got to picture that. You got the individual needle that going into your skin, and then there's this zap. And so you can imagine how many hairs have to be covered all over your face. So it becomes very, very painful. But you get used to it like anything else. Todd? Hello? Yes, I'm here. What were you doing? Picturing electrolysis? Oh no, I actually I had some of it done when I was oh, okay. on my back. I didn't like it. it. Didn't work. Oh yeah, you were telling. Oh, that's right. Yeah, it, was, it would have taken it would have taken way too long, and I couldn't deal with the pain. Mm. It was too much. I, I think I've mentioned this before. I've been I've been lucky also with the the fat. I got the small nose, and and I also I'm a hairless person, so I was lucky that way. Not in my face, though I wasn't. I'm not going to lie about that. But um, my body, it's like I was just one of those hairless people. And so oh, I didn't yeah. have to go through a lot of that kind of electrolysis. And I certainly had nothing on my back, thank God. I can't even imagine. I was going to mention about um, having, again, having Dr. Middleton on the show. And he's he's a charming man. And he's he's quite brilliant. And he's very easy to talk with. His staff... Um, at the clinic are incredible young women, um, the nurses, very professional people. And so anybody decides they want to have a consultation, I'm not saying you should go and see Dr. Middleton. I'm just saying if you decide to have a consultation, I would recommend him. And if you tell him that it, you are recommended, don't say Mandy because he wouldn't know Mandy, but Amanda Taylor recommended that you come and see him, then believe me, he will sit and talk to you about, you know, what your expectations are, and if you have more than one procedure or whatever, he will give you a deal, okay? Um, he will talk to you about making this fit with your finances because it's, it's expensive. But you're getting quality work, and that's the important thing. But he's located at 120 Spadina Road, which is just north of Bloor, and it's in this lovely townhouse that's made into a clinic, and it's quite beautiful and very, very comfortable. And um, his phone number, if anybody wants to write it down, Dr. Middleton, 416-966-3223 is his phone number. And if you want to visit his website, he's got pictures on there and everything. And actually, there's a little video clip of a trans woman on there who got cheek implants and a couple of other procedures. And she talks about her experience and I like the fact that he's a mainstream doctor who didn't mind putting a video of a trans woman on his website. A lot of the other times we're hidden. The doctors don't talk that we even exist, right? We're just some, you know, underground people. But I love the fact that he's very upfront um, regarding trans people, and he's very comfortable with trans people, and that's important to me. So his website is Middleton Cosmetics dot com and if you do a search on Google for Dr. Middleton um you will be able to find him on Google almost immediately. But um I'm just sending out my wishes to everybody out there who's considering any sort of physical transitioning and they decide there's something, you know, they're not comfortable with or even if it's just a simple thing of visiting a clinic to get Botox or decide to get a little refreshing. Um, you know, I, I, I send out my wishes to you, and I hope everything works out well. And, and like I said earlier, make sure you are comfortable with a doctor. Build a relationship. Don't just go to some doctor because you think he's got certificates and he's going to be good. 
And, you know, it doesn't work that way. You've got to really have a relationship with the doctor. You've got to talk to him, make sure you're comfortable with him, and make sure you're 100% confident in him. And it's not just the doctor. Always, always watch for who people surround themselves with. I know I do. It's never just the person. And so when I'm looking at the staff he's surrounded with, I'm seeing a good person because I'm going, wow, this guy knows how to pick his staff as well. And that's important to me. That means he knows what he's doing. So anyway, that being sent out there, I hope you all find what you're looking for. And um, hopefully we'll have Dr. Middleton on the show next week. If not, we'll have him on very soon. And we'll have Sharon. She's the nurse there at Dr. Middleton's. And she's the one that does the Botox and um, the fillers. When I say fillers, I'm talking about like for smile lines and such, little things you want puffed out and up. You know, sometimes you'd be amazed at the difference just having um, injectables along your cheek line for the girls out there. If you puff up your cheeks a bit, it gives you a little bit of a faceless look, uh, but not with a stretchy skin, obviously, but a nice little plumping up and a more youthful look. And sometimes every now and then that's all you need to make you feel, oh, you know, I feel, you know, I feel pretty, oh, so pretty. So anyway, that being said, Todd, do you have anything to say in closing? No. <laughs> For Todd, this isn't really, really your bag, is it? But, but you've yeah, seen. I'm, I'm very interested in it. And you and you've seen, you've lived amongst us, so you, you've seen a lot of their procedures, and you've seen a lot of the the girls going through um, their um, their physical changes. Oh yeah, no, I'm, I support it, and I'm you know, I'm happy when they when they're happy, and you know. You know that's the thing. It's a very exciting thing for us to to have the the ones who choose to have cosmetic surgery. It's very exciting for us. It's like a it's a new revitalization. It's like you know you're going. It's better than buying a new outfit or even getting your hair done. It's just something that's kind of it makes you feel a little better. It just adds a little more energy, and you enjoy it and you're excited. And I get excited for the girls too when they're talking about it. And well, I'm going to get this done, getting this done, finally getting my tits. That's the big thing they all say. I'm finally getting my tits, and you know, and I try to explain to them, my darlings. It doesn't matter about the implants. If it makes you feel good and you make, you know, it gives you some sort of confidence that's wonderful, you're getting your breasts done, but please don't, you know, don't feel that that is what makes you into a trans woman because it's not. You know, it's just one more thing, you know, along your way if you decide, but that doesn't mean because you don't get implants and you don't have hormone breasts that you're not just as much as transsexual as anybody else. It has nothing to do with the physical. So I'll be looking forward to talking to those professionals. And we're also going to ask Sharon about, she was talking to me about Botox parties, which are, which are legal. Um, you can get together groups of people to get a, a better deal on, on Botox and injectables. And you get a bunch of people together, and it's kind of like a little party you have. And, you know, you step off to the side, and you kind of get your injectables or your Botox done, and then you come back, and you join everybody else, and you go one at a time and get your injectables in a party atmosphere so you feel you're surrounded with friends, you know, and people who are there for the same thing. So it's kind of, I like the social atmosphere for that. Well, it's almost like when you get your polio shot in grade school. It is. No, it's not. Well, then why would you even say that? <laughs> I thought it was funny. Okay. I didn't realize that at your party when you're having your polio shot. But anyway, that being said, so if we're having any of those Botox parties in the future, we'll be sending out mailing lists and everything, and um, you can join. And um, you don't even have to get anything done. Just just come by, and, you know, we'll have a little party, and you can watch. or Well, you can't watch people get injected, but... You can ask the nurse questions, and you can you know, make you feel more comfortable. Then the next time you come back, you might decide to get something done. But that's only if you want to. And remember, you don't need cosmetic surgery. That is just something if you decide that you want to do on a personal level, then power to you. And I hope you're happy with the results. All right. Well, you have a good night, everybody. And thank you, my business partner, friend, Todd Plink, for joining me for this. And we'll talk to you all soon.
Bye.